hey, if you fail, it's always good to get yourself up and try again. My name is Kit. This is Americans Learn. And today we're going to get our learn on about the Mark 14 torpedo. Failures like onions, you know. Mama always said failures like onions. You're always going to cry. <laughs> Come on. That was a funny joke. Put down your tomatoes. Anyways, this video is from uh, Drake and Fell. I hope I said that name right. So please, folks, we here at Americans Learn encourage all of you, because we all have fun here, to please, though, support the original content creator. That link is in the description box below, so you hip cool cats better do the right thing, because I expect it out of all of you. But this video... I think, it's, I think it's important for us to understand about the Mark 14 torpedo. And if we're going to go down the path that I think we're going to go down, it's going to be a long, sad history of people not doing their job, people not checking the equipment, and uh, unfortunately, maybe people kind of, sort of, maybe most likely 100% guarantee dying. And to quote an anime line that is long since forever living in an internet history, people die when they are killed. If you understood the reference, I love you. If you didn't, it's okay. But it's an actual line that's been said. So no worries. Much love. So while I'm in charge of the ones and twos, grab yourself a tasty snack and a tasty beverage, and let's get ready to play this video in a three, a two, and uno. Glorious. The item is splendid. How splendid. Ah, yes. The Mark 14 torpedo. So many questions. Who invented the Mark 14? What was the Mark 14? Why was the Mark 14? Good question. Well, the origins of the Mark 14 torpedo are actually relatively unremarkable. The US Navy had a perfectly serviceable torpedo in the shape of the Mark 10, which dated from World War I. But this weapon had a number of shortcomings by the time of the early 1930s. Its near quarter ton warhead was substantial, but newer capital ships had been designed to withstand worse. Its effective range and speed were also now best described as uncomfortably close and pedestrian, with a number of destroyers in many navies coming into service ostensibly having top speeds that were flat out faster than the Mark 10, meaning that a simple turn away and run for a few thousand yards would be a 100% guaranteed escape for these vessels, and some cruisers were not much slower. The introduction of the newer, larger fleet submarines meant that, whilst the 21-inch diameter would be kept, the torpedo tubes themselves could be made longer to accommodate a longer torpedo. Longer is always better, right? Which would then have more fuel and a more advanced engine, as well as an extra crewman's body weight and explosives. Design work would start in 1931, and would eventually yield a weapon capable of travelling almost three times as far as the Mark 10 when it was going at similar speeds, or around a thousand yards further than the older weapon at substantially higher speeds. Other work was being done to try and improve the speed at which the torpedo would actually level out at its design cruising depth, as well as further work ensuring that the gyroscope, which was a key part of keeping the torpedo going in a straight line, remained powered throughout its journey. Whereas a number of ships in World War I had either gone down or been sent packing by single torpedo hits due to either relatively or, in some cases, completely lacking underwater protection, mm. by now newer ships had extensive torpedo defence systems, and even older vessels were being refitted with bulges. This in turn... That's a huge bulge right there. All right, all right. I'll try and keep my uh, humor to a minimum, but that is fascinating. I never really uh, under knew uh, just how much the technology was advancing and how uh, many of the battleships... Obviously, you know, trial and error and the horrors of the First World War, because we're all familiar with the trench warfare and the introduction of modern warfare through machine guns, tanks, 
and other forms of deadly weaponry uh, becoming more prevalent. Of course, that also would apply to everything in the air as well in the sea. So with the loss of so many ships, especially between the central powers and the allied powers, uh, it would be very reasonable for nations and empires to advance their technology from what they learned from the previous war. Only what would follow is something far more devastating, far more devastating weapons. And the horror continues on. Then meant that torpedoes had to evolve. You could, of course, pack in more boom, which was always a good thing. Mm -hmm. But the weapon itself had size restrictions, even in the newer subs. So you could try the new technique that had been derived from observations of underwater explosions in World War I, especially those of German so-called magnetic mines, yeah. which had been borne out in subsequent testing in the early 1920s, and that was to go for an underkeel detonation. Whilst this is a fundamental part of modern torpedo design, back in the interwar period it was brand new, and also faced a rather considerable problem. All torpedoes at this point had used contact detonators, but a torpedo running deeper, under the target's keel, would of course not hit anything. So how would you set one off in the right place? The solution appeared to be the rather, rather bluntly named Mark VI Exploder. This was a new kind of detonator that did not rely on... Already looking at this I feel unsafe and I feel like my legs and arms are going to be ripped off on physical contact, but rather the change in magnetic field created by the ferrous metals that made up the hull and major internal systems of modern warships. When the weapon passed into this magnetic disturbance, it would trigger the detonator. It seemed a perfect solution, and other navies were indeed working on similar devices. The Germans had started the trend with the aforementioned mine, but the British were also working on a similar detonator. It was at this point, however, that problems would first start to develop. Work on the Mark VI was viewed paradoxically as an absolute top-secret technology, despite the fact that it was inspired by what was, at the time, a decade-old technology that had been used by another nation. This paranoia ran to the point that once the manual describing how the new detonator worked was actually written, it was then locked away in a safe, where nobody who could actually use the thing in service would ever be able to access it. That's the dumbest... Uh, you know what, it's not the first time we've seen dumb people. Won't be the last. Presumably in a basement behind a sign saying beware of the leopard. Mm -hmm. Further issues would arise during testing. Tests by each nation on their own magnetic detonation devices took place in, well, the areas of the ocean that they happened to have access to, shockingly enough. And this meant that the sensitivity of the detonator, and the relative change in the magnetic field that was induced by a ship's hull, was relevant only to that and a few similar areas of the world. Which was something that would come back to haunt all navies who tried to use this technology in the early part of World War II. This was because the magnetic field of the Earth is not, in fact, constant all over the planet. No, it wouldn't be. I mean, each part of the world... <coughs> hey, how about this one? Each part of the world is beautiful and unique in its own way, and it's special. Which means so many people are going to die because this, this was a bad idea. In the long, sad history of bad ideas, it sounds great on paper, but no. No bueno. No bueno at all. It varies by location, especially by latitude, but local geological makeup, and sometimes even the time of year, can also affect this field strength. This could therefore result in a torpedo that was configured in one location, but live fired elsewhere, either not functioning at all, as a weaker magnetic field would not activate the detonator, or else explode far too soon, as a stronger field would trip the detonators almost the moment they were active. The former issue would largely plague the Germans, and the latter issue would largely affect the British until workarounds were established during the Second World War. But, since this was not yet a known factor, the US Navy happily gathered information based on testing around the equatorial regions of the world, and would develop the sensitivities of the Mark VI Exploder based on this data. Hmm. Once these investigative test runs were done, the new Mark XIV torpedo promised to be a new and lethal addition to the US Navy's arsenal. 
with the first production tour. That's going to be a disaster. I already know it. We dinosaurs are doomed. I just know it. Torpedoes being rolled out, all that was left was a few full live fire tests to determine that all the various systems that had been thrown together were working as intended in sync with each other. But here Congress's determination to throttle the US Navy out of every loose nickel and dime came to the fore, as well as the somewhat disjointed relationship between various boards of development, all of which ostensibly were working for the same goal. The Navy itself offered an old destroyer that was destined for scrap as a target, but they didn't want the additional expense of having to refloat it, and the loss of scrap value that blowing large parts of it off would entail, and so they insisted that the Bureau of Ordnance pay for any such costs that were involved in the testing of what they saw as the Bureau of Ordnance's torpedo. Buord declined to pay out, and so the live fire tests were never actually done. You know, I think a live fire test is kind of important. You know, get that information so you don't see your ship sink. Ah, oh, never mind. You know what? Screaming into the ether. There was also the cost of the weapon itself. At $10,000 per torpedo in 19... Ah, boy, that's pretty high in today's... Hey, remember when $20 used to get you a whole grocery cart of groceries? <laughs> that's right, I'm, d I'm digging up that old joke. That Macaulay Culkin joke where he had $20 and Andrew Jackson, he got a whole grocery cart of stuff. Remember, remember when a dollar used to mean something? I do. And I'm crying on the inside. Hey, who remembers when gasoline used to be 99 cents? That's right, kids. When I was a wee lad, younger than you, I remember 99 cents. And there's probably going to be some Gen Xers and Boomers who will say, well, I remember when gasoline was a lot cheaper than 99 cents. And they're telling the truth. Money used to mean something back in the day. Money used to mean something. 1930s money, each weapon cost almost as much as a then brand new F2F fighter. And once delivered, the USN oh. was somewhat reluctant to blow up such an investment unless they absolutely had to. And so it was directed that any tests that might be done in the future would not use a live warhead, but instead, instead a dummy warhead made of balancing weights was installed purely to ensure that the torpedo remained balanced on its run and didn't act like a gigantic explosive porpoise. Coupled with this were issues... I feel pain. People are going to die, aren't they? Good lord, people are going to die because they didn't do their job. Involving actually... Or, wait, people are going to die because other people who are supposed to, you know, test the freaking thing didn't do their job. Getting enough torpedoes out there to the fleet in the first place. Whilst they were a munition, a torpedo is far more complex and took far longer to build than a shell for a naval gun, even a battleship shell. Torpedoes, remember, are effectively small self-guiding kamikaze submarines, and so unless you have a large factory and an extensive production line going, you're only going to see handfuls produced each year. After experiencing serious problems in World War I, having received, in the course of the entire war, only enough torpedoes for a couple of major engagements, the US Navy had invested heavily in expanding torpedo production, especially in anticipation of the vast numbers of torpedoes that would be needed by the Clemson Swarm and their leaders, the Omaha-class cruisers. But the Washington Naval Treaty had seen most of that particular fleet sent into reserve or to the scrapyard, as well as general funding pretty much collapse, and so several million dollars of investment in torpedo production went away almost as fast as the factory had been constructed. All this meant that by the 1930s there was precisely one factory capable of designing, building and testing torpedoes which also meant that no one was around who could check on the claimed performance of the Mark 14, despite the rather obvious bias that the manufacturer would have. In oh yeah, yeah, totally. We, 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 we totally checked it out, and it's A-OK. -okay. Now keep on giving us money. Money me. Money me now. Good lord, so many people are going to die at the bottom of the ocean, aren't they? Or so many people are going to die, and their bodies are going to be at the bottom of the ocean. It's okay. 
I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. In reporting, namely that, of course, everything was absolutely perfect. The small budgets that were available also meant small orders, which would mean fewer machines and fewer workers. And so even as the US Navy began to pick up the pace of construction as the 1930s rolled on and began to order more and more torpedoes, the bemused factory found itself struggling to keep up with the increasing demand and expand at the same time. Uh -huh. With orders coming in for submarine torpedoes, destroyer torpedoes, aerial torpedoes, and torpedoes suitable for PT boats, a rather large backlog began to build, with torpedo production averaging just over half a dozen of all types combined every week. And even by the late... Say it with me, folks, for the people in back. What could possibly go wrong? 1930s, as the factory had hit its expansion limits, a backlog of hundreds and then thousands of torpedoes was opening up. This, in turn, left the US Navy even more hesitant than ever to risk losing even one of the precious Mark 14 stock in any kind of live-fire test. Uh -huh. Emergency measures were taken towards the end of the decade. The old factory the US Navy had briefly run during and shortly after World War I that had been shuttered was restarted after some rather clever political manoeuvring by the US Navy, as the first attempt to do so was blocked by politicians who were more concerned with their re-election than the national interest, and who were therefore determined just to keep torpedo production in their particular state. This end run, opening the factory, managed to bring production levels up to a mighty three torpedoes per day. Excuse me! The US Navy target of 50 per day. As Europe descended into war, more money and 24-7 production was unlocked, but the production rate would still remain at less than half the targeted rate. In desperation, the- Does anyone care to do their job? Hello? Avon calling. US Navy began contracting out to various other companies, including the car maker Pontiac, the American Can Company, who really missed a trick building frigates, as well as a combine harvester maker, and a number of other companies of increasingly implausible titles when it comes to, well, weapons of warfare. Then, of course, war came to... It's okay. Even though this is decades long before I was born, I'm already getting a migraine. I kind of feel like they're just sitting like, hey, shouldn't anyone just do their job? You know, I mean, that's a controversial statement here. But maybe, maybe people should do their job. Just do your job. You know, test things out. Double check, triple check, you know. Dot every I, cross every T. I mean, is that a bridge too far? Oh, wait, it kind of is in this day and age, too. Because no one wants to do their job anymore. No one wants to do anything anymore. Well, I'm going to change that. To American soil in the form of the Kido Butai's early morning wake-up call to Pearl Harbor. Yep. And they, rather inconsiderately, managed to blow up over 200 of the carefully husbanded Mark 14s in the process. All of this meant that as American submarines surged out from various ports into their first major battle, which was to save, or at least stall, the Imperial Japanese assault on the Philippines, they were using a weapon that had never actually been tested in live firing of which they had precious few in the first place, and for which the instruction manual for the most sensitive and technically advanced part of the device was slowly collecting mildew in a safe on the other side of the Pacific. But with an all-out assault by the Japanese underway, shortages or not, the US Navy submariners were going to fire their torpedoes at any targets they could find. This, being basically the first live firing cycle for the Mark 14, was when the problems began to show up. Within weeks of the start of operations, reports began to come in, and they were not good. Torpedoes were being fired, but ships were rather inconveniently staying afloat. Torpedoes had been observed sailing under ships without exploding. Other times, they were exploding far too early, and still others had ploughed headlong into their targets, with the crash of over a ton of metal slamming into a ship at highway speed, echoing through the ocean and back to the hydrophone operators aboard US submarines. But few, if any, were actually doing their job of exploding on target. More worryingly, a number of submarines... It's like this all could have been avoided. 
All of this could have been avoided. Maybe if people did their job. But oh no. Everyone wanted to squeeze every single little penny. It's okay. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm just furious and disappointed. Furious and disappointed. Marines were simply vanishing without any sign or report of engagement, either from them or by the enemy. As it turned out, the Mark 14 had more than one problem, but they were stacking on top of each other, which at the start masked the extent of the issue. On top of this, the Bureau of Ordnance absolutely refused to accept the rising criticism and growing anger of the US submarine's captains. Yeah, it means do your job, Bureau of Ordnance. No, no, no. I'm sorry for yelling. I'm sorry for yelling. I will try and lower my tone, but I'm quite furious here. Insisting that their wonder weapon was absolutely perfect. No, it's and not. It was, in fact, the submariner's fault. They were simply incompetent, Bjord said, and they weren't using the torpedo correctly. They also reiterated that no, there would not be any tests, especially now when torpedoes were being expended faster than they could be produced. This was despite the captains of both USS Sargo and USS Sea Dragon, amongst others, even going so far as to break radio silence in the middle of an operation after having fired dozens of torpedoes in textbook attacks, only to watch the Imperial Japanese Navy's warships and transports that they were targeting serenely sail away into the sunset with nary a scratch of paint on their hulls to show for it. The first suspect wasn't actually the Mark VI detonator, but rather the Mark XIV's torpedo depth setting. Although field fixes had still yielded little in terms of results, these weapons that had been fixed by the crews aboard the submarines were at least scraping paint off of the targets, as opposed to motoring along far below bothering the local fish. Bureau of Ordnance's first reaction when they learned of this was to recommend disciplinary action against any US Navy officer who'd made alterations, ostensibly for improper maintenance of the Mark 14, which they con continued to insist was absolutely fine. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. You're not in the field, Mr. Bureau of Ordnance. Those captains and their crew are. So if they want to do some things to make sure that they, oh, I don't know, controversial statement here, maybe go home to their friends and family, you know, maybe have a life after the war. I, I mean, maybe I, I let the guys, you know, do what they got to do so they could come on home. Is that a bridge too far? Apparently for the Bureau of Ordnance and those pencil pushers, I guess it is. Meanwhile, back in the real world, the newly promoted Rear Admiral Lockwood had taken over command of US submarine efforts in the most active part of the Pacific Campaign. With summer of 1942 approaching, his forces had fired off more than a year's production of Mark 14s mm -hmm. in around six months, and had precious little to show for it. He decided that... Alright buddy, batter's up. Maybe you can give us a home run homer and we no longer have to deal with this BS. Bjord's decree or not, he was going to conduct some tests and get to the bottom of this. USS Skipjack was corralled for That's the task, good name. and a torpedo That's a good name. warhead was dutifully fired at a torpedo net, set for a running depth of 10 feet, with the idea that the torpedo would punch a hole in the net as it passed, showing where the torpedo was actually running. As they reeled the net in, 10 foot showed no hole. Then came 15 foot, then 20 foot. Eventually, after 25 feet of netting had come up, a hole was revealed. At that depth, only a heavily loaded battleship would have been hit, and even then a lucky swell might well carry anything short of the Yamato herself clear of such a torpedo. Two further tests the following day showed similar results, with the average difference between the depth setting on the torpedo and the actual depth it travelled at being around 11 feet. Okay. Buord was absolutely furious that their instructions to not test the torpedo had been disregarded. But un Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Instructions not to test? No, no. I think it's important to test. To test. Hey, you know, because cause, cause I can imagine, like, you know, somebody coming up to me, knocking my door, and. Oh, guess what? I built myself a rocket to go to the moon, and I want to put you on it. 
oh, you want to put me in a rocket? Did you test it? Did you test it with dummies? Did you use, you know, your computer to make sure that I'd get to the get to the moon in your little fantastic rocket? Did you test it on yourself? I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe double checking, triple checking. Until then, f right off. Seriously, don't test it. No, test it, and test again. Unfortunately for them, and fortunately for the U.S. submariners, the news of the tests also got to Admiral King. Good. Who was chief of naval operations at the time. Good. Yes, that Admiral King. And if there's one thing King hated more than enemies of the U.S. Navy, or the British, which to his mind sometimes were synonymous, it was people who shortchanged his sailors. Mm. Within weeks of the tests, and... Hey, man, what? you do realize that there are allies, right? I mean, you know, I mean, these... We're fighting off against the Germans in the Empire of Japan. There, there are allies. You, you know there are allies, right? Admiral, <laughs> Admiral King, come on, meet me at the halfway point. Shortly after a number of visits and letters from Admiral King, Beward's tone suddenly changed. It now admitted that, yes, in fact, the torpedo was running deep. And shortly thereafter, one imagines Admiral King standing behind the official and twisting their arm just that little bit further. They admitted that, no, they hadn't actually done any proper design or testing of the depth-keeping device. The reasons for this failure were manifold, but primarily related to the very few tests that had been done pre-war. In these, a dummy warhead was fitted as previously described, but this warhead was deliberately lighter than the real one. This was so that the torpedo would float to the surface once it ran out of fuel, and thus could be easily recovered. This in turn meant that to run at the desired depth, the torpedo had to correct considerably more downwards than it would have had to do if the real, heavier warhead had been aboard. Thus, with the heavier actual explosive in place, the torpedo would force itself deeper than was otherwise desired. Oh my this God. was compounded by a number of other factors. The warhead's size had been slightly increased since the Mark 14 had first been put into service, which made it heavier still, and thus dragged it down further still. Also, the devices used to measure the depth of a test torpedo, both on shore and the recorder built into the weapon, had errors in their design that led to an artificially shallow result being recorded. The onboard depth sensor that fed into the control fins was also compromised by its position. Previous such me pressure measuring devices had been mounted along the body of a torpedo, okay. but the Mark 14s was installed on the cone-shaped tail. In this area, where water flowed back around the torpedo, and it was also in the vicinity of the propeller, the local water pressure was somewhat lower than average for the given depth, thus given, giving the depth control device a falsely shallow reading, and so even deeper the torpedo went. This last was an especially wonderful thing, as this problem would only show up when the torpedo was actually moving. If you simply placed a weapon in a tank at a given depth, it would of course give the correct reading, as the water around it was relatively static. As it should. Only a live fire test with a fast moving torpedo would generate the low pressure bubble, and thus indicate the actual issue. Mm -hmm. Somewhat masked though it may have been by all the other errors in the recording device itself. Still, with this issue now identified, on some US subs the skippers simply dialed the depth setting down to practically nothing. The torpedoes would now at least run at a depth where they should be hitting the target until a more permanent fix, which was moving the depth sensor port back to the middle of the torpedo body, could be implemented on newly built weapons. As the summer of 1942 rolled on, the Mark 14 was now at at least roughly the right depth. However, more and more reports were now arriving of weapons that were simply smashing into a target without exploding, or else exploding very short something which had been present in small amounts earlier, but would now account for the majority of the failures. The Imperial Japanese Navy remained irritatingly afloat, with most successes to date credited... Yeah, I mean, the whole point if you're going to war is you, you want your torpedoes to hit the boat, so the enemy boat sinks to the bottom of the ocean, so your submarines can then come on home. You know? Like what they're supposed to do. Did ...to the Dutch flotilla with occasional input from the few British and other Allied Imperial submarines that were still in the operational area. Over the next few months, multiple attacks on the Japanese carriers were launched by lucky US submarines. With over a dozen torpedoes, 
having the potential to sink several carriers, ending up simply detonating in open water, along with several others that would hit, but didn't explode. And a couple that by some miracle actually did their job and damaged their target somewhat. In that particular case it was the carrier Eo. But the ship survived as two other torpedoes in the salvo, which likely would have finished it off, completely failed to work. Once again, the initial behind the lines belief was that no, there was no problem, sir. The super secret magnetic detonator must be working perfectly. After all, we invented it. Uh, but this was not the case. The magnetic field near the area where initial development trials had been run was somewhat weaker than the magnetic field in the area where the torpedoes were actually being used. And so what was happening now was that with this much stronger magnetic field, the torpedoes were detonating when they detected a disturbance in line with their calibration, except that this disturbance was well before the target. And with the stronger fields tripping the detonator too early, when they worked at all, the torpedo would simply shower the target ship with sea spray. Running the torpedo somewhat deeper would in theory allow it to get closer, as the overall field strength of the ship would diminish with depth. Mm -hmm. But nobody was going to set a Mark 14 to run deep again for a little while after the incidents earlier in the war. A year and a half into the conflict, and with little to show for their efforts, US submariners were deactivating the detonators of their own accord against Good. orders. Good. With Buord experts Good. coming out and issuing reports that once again blamed the crews for not using their weapons properly. Screw the board. I trust the crews. And if your family members were part of these uh, elite submarine crew members, please type, type, type and regale us of stories of their glories and triumphs, their victories, and yes, even their moments of, well, struggle. So, it, listen, to our viewing audience, if you had a family member that was part of these glorious uh, submarines that had to deal with the Mark 14, this torpedo of absolute failure... Uh, please share your story or share their story in the comment section below. We would love to hear it. Properly, despite these same experts making constant mistakes in setting up the torpedoes that the they were experts. supposed to know everything about, to the point of the submarine's crews having to correct the experts' work to prevent the subsequent launch finally resulting in something being sunk, namely the submarine that had just launched the Mark 14. This, in spite of the fact that premature explosions had actually been a known issue to Bjord for about three years at this point. But of course, they couldn't be seen to lose face. Finally, almost two years into the war, reality began to sink in yet again, mm. and orders filtered through the fleet to deactivate the Mark VI magnetic exploder. With one final holdout, Rear Admiral Christie, finally being overruled by more senior officers. Good. The reason for Christie's refusal? Well, he'd been on the team that had helped to develop the Mark VI and would sooner believe that his entire command, namely the Australian-based US submarine units, was full of utter rank incompetence, rather than admit he might, in some way, possibly, have made a mistake two decades earlier. And so, with the primary detonator deactivated and the depth control issue on its way to being fixed, the remaining issue was that a quite a large number of torpedoes were now in fact hitting their targets, but not detonating at all. This made Failure. little sense at first because, well, the Mark 14 did have a backup contact detonator. Surely this system couldn't be malfunctioning as well. Well, that question could be answered in extreme detail and with a lot of colourful language by the crew of the USS Tinosa, mm. who had come across a Japanese whaling ship and unleashed no fewer than 15 torpedoes into it, scoring 13 hits, enough to put any vessel on the ocean floor, let alone a relatively small 19,000 ton civilian whaling ship. Instead, with only one torpedo left to their name, the crew simply heard clang after clang after crash as duds poked tiny holes in their prey. Wow! The last weapon aboard was brought back to port, where Buord dutifully reported that, of course, there was absolutely nothing wrong with it. However, the US Navy's officers were becoming less and less intimidated by Buord's bluster, and more tests were conducted shortly thereafter at Pearl Harbor, 
involving both firing torpedoes at nearby cliffs, as well as dropping torpedo heads off of a gantry onto the ground, with only the contact detonator enabled and no warhead, obviously. What they found was that in almost three quarters of cases, hits that impacted perpendicular to the target, the ideal angle that US sub commanders were trained to aim for, failed to explode. However, they did also find that ang impacts at an angle tended to work slightly more often, and so immediate orders were issued to go against pre-war training and try and aim torpedoes to strike targets at an angle. At an angle. This saw some improvement at once, but, but duds were still a major problem. Back ashore, further investigation continued, and what they found was that the contact detonator was a descendant of an older unit that had shown similar problems, but at a somewhat lower level. This was because... I'm getting stressed out here. I almost want to run and rip off my face and scream at the Bureau. You're effing up royally here! Whereas you might imagine that a detonator pin should be in line with the torpedo's direction of travel, in the case of this particular lineage of contact detonators, Bjord, in their infinite wisdom, had decided to align the pin at 90 degrees to the line of travel of the torpedo, so that when the torpedo slammed into a target, the deceleration would force the pin sideways against its mounting, the friction slowing or stopping it from activating completely until the deceleration was over. Unfortunately, the deceleration being over usually corresponded to the entire mechanism being destroyed by the torpedo head smashing itself headlong into the ship's hull. The angled approach had some success because the impact was spread out over a slightly longer period, okay. and the direction of travel was now slightly closer to the firing pin's line of travel, which reduced the level of friction on the mounting and gave a slightly higher chance for the device to actually work. Although this had been a problem, as mentioned previously, in the older 30 knot Mark X torpedo, the Bureau of Ordnance had simply assumed that, using the same, slightly stronger mounting spring that they'd eventually used to solve the problem in the older weapon, the detonator would work absolutely fine at the much higher 46 knot impact speed that the Mark XIV was capable of when fired up close. The idea being that with a more powerful spring, the pin would travel across and detonate before the deceleration could pin it against the side of its mounting. Needless to say, and shockingly enough, they were wrong. And, needless to say, if they'd done some actual testing before the war, this issue, along with all the others, would also have been picked up. That would have been great. A short-term solution was devised by the machinists at Pearl Harbor by replacing the firing pin and other parts related to it with copies that were made of aluminium, the lighter parts having less inertia and thus somewhat less resistance to the spring's sideways movement even when they were undergoing a high-speed deceleration. In new build weapons, Buord would grudgingly, grudgingly adopt an electric detonator that was triggered by a simple ball switch. Good. But by now, winter of 1943 approached. Almost two years into the war, and the Mark XIV was finally, now, mostly working. Several thousand torpedoes and dozens of missed targets later. There was still a remaining issue of faulty gyroscopes sometimes sending the torpedoes spiralling back at the vessels that had launched them. Whoa! Excuse me! That's ca hey, Whoa! 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 Hold on! You fire the missile, it comes right back at you? Responsible for at least two losses of US submarines, as well as a number of close calls and uh, rather nasty scares. But, to be fair, this was an issue that plagued more than just the Mark 14, and indeed would show up on occasion in many other navies during the war. And so, whilst this particular failure was especially deadly, and even more so once the Mark 14 actually would start exploding, it was not a particular failing of the Mark 14. Now, shockingly, once a torpedo travelled at something resembling the right depth with a detonator that actually worked, the number of vessels that were sunk by US submarines suddenly began to rise. Cool, all right. Helped by the introduction, admittedly, of Torpex in 1942, a new form of explosive that was uh, rather wittingly named Torpex because it was the torpedo explosive, mm -hmm. which happened to give the torpedo a punch about 50% greater than its original TNT warhead had possessed. Indeed, 
these fixed Mark 14s would bag the single largest warship ever sunk by a submarine when USS Archerfish sent the carrier Shinano to the bottom later in the war. These fixes would also spread out to other weapons, the Mark 13 aerial torpedo, the Mark 15 aboard US destroyers, and the Mark 18 aboard PT boats would all benefit from varying to varying degrees from the solutions that had been arrived at with the Mark 14. Okay. Since their own issues stemmed from similar design failures by Buell. I'm already having a panic attack just, just seeing just how, not just a panic attack, I'm getting stressed out just how stupid this is. You know, we're, we're in the middle of a war here and the thing ain't working. I can only imagine FDR's office being calm, like, hey guys, this is FDR, President of the United States. Why aren't my torpedoes working? Why aren't they working? Why are they sinking the enemy ships? Can you please tell me? Yes? Hello? Maybe yes, maybe no? I don't know. Reward. Ironically enough, the US Navy managed to overcome its bottleneck of torpedo production around the same time that it overcame most of the issues with the Mark 14. And so by the end of the war, huge stockpiles of perhaps the most reworked torpedo in existence were just sitting around. Whilst the Mark 14 would be improved into the Mark 16 post-war, using a number of features taken from German torpedoes, so many Mark 14s remained in stock that they wouldn't actually leave US Navy service until the early 1980s, albeit they were very much a second-line weapon by that point, making this utter disaster of a Buord project eventually morph into what was actually the longest serving torpedo in US Navy history. The Mark 14 and its um, questionable capabilities in the first couple of the years of the war remains one of the greatest, if somewhat less known, mm -hmm. what ifs of World War II yeah. that have a relatively plausible point of change. You see, even a small live firing test program in the early 1930s might have resulted in the US Navy entering the war with an actually functioning torpedo, instead of the next best thing to sailing up to a target and raising a flag with the word BANG written on it, mounted on a periscope. If this live fire test program had happened and fixes had been implemented, the Japanese Navy might have found itself quite a few ships short prior even to the battles of Coral Sea and Midway. And even if that somehow didn't change the forces available for those two battles, the Mark 13 aerial torpedo was similarly affected by Buord's curse, and so both the ineffectual devastator attack using the Mark 13 Are you kidding on, me? as well as the submarine attack on the battlecruiser Kirishima by submarine might both have borne fruit. And whilst it may seem easy to dismiss Buord's conduct as simply saving money in the interwar period, their continued obstruction of any and all attempts to solve the problems once the war began likely delayed the devising and implementation of solutions by a considerable amount of time. Depending on the source, it's, this is rated at at least months, possibly even up to a year or so. The cost in time, effort, and of course lives of servicemen failed by their weapons, all caused by this practically unforgivable behaviour by Buord cannot be overlooked and definitely should not be forgotten. No. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you Okay, five minutes or less. Wow, that definitely explained a lot in five minutes or less about the absolute failure of the Board of or uh, Bureau of Ordnance for the Navy. But it doesn't surprise me, as uh, I have served in the Marine Corps, and let's face it, there's a lot of bureaucracy. I'm pretty sure every ser single service branch in the United States Armed Forces, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, Reservists, National Guard, we all know firsthand just how incompetent the bureaucracy can be. Semper Gumby, always faithful, trust the bureaucrats. Bu bureaucracy, the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. That's right. You may not know him, but bureaucracy is the fifth guy, and uh, let's just say uh, he's a real pain in the wazoo. Holy cow! So much set us back because some pencil pushers said, oh, jeez, no, it's just perfectly fine. You gotta trust us, guys. We never let you go wrong. Stupid morons, stupid idiots who don't know anything. The dumbest stuff I've ever seen, ever. I'm beyond furious. I'm beyond angry.
You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that quote from uh, Kevin Sorbo from Hercules. Very disappointed. Disappointed. Very disappointed. <sighs> Holy cow. All right, folks, listen. I'm upset, but here's what I want to hear. If we got any members of our viewing audience that had a relative, family member, on the submarines when the Mark 14 was being used. Tell us of their story, their time of service, dealing with the trials and tribulations of the Mark 14 that the Bureau of Ordnance said was, eh, okay. I'd like to hear those stories. Please type them out. I think it's long overdue. We hear their triumphs and victories as well as the over overlining nightmare of dealing with the Bureau of Ordnance, if they ever had to deal with the Bureau of Ordnance, if he had family members who were officers, captains, who had to deal with the bureaucrats, because let's face it, the officers had to deal with the more political end of everything, regale us of their story. I think it's long overdue that we hear just how incompetent bureaucracy can be. I'm angry, and I think I'm going to pour myself another glass of wine because I'm furious. Until then... Please support the original content creator. That link is in the description box below. A lot of effort was put into making this video. It was five minutes, by the way. And uh, I'll see all of you on the flip side. Take good care and anything named Mark 14, beware.